everybody, this is Christian Buckley doing another MVP buzz chat. I'm talking today with Eric. Hello. Hello, Christian. How are you today? I'm doing well. Yeah, we'll have to get into stuff. For, for folks that don't know you, who are you, where are you, and what do you do? Uh, my name is Eric Legault. I'm an MVP for Office or M365 Development, not Office 365. Yeah, I know. Okay. It, ro it rolls off the tongue, I know. Yeah, it's hard to adapt. You keep changing yeah. Um, yeah, an MVP for M365 developer. I live in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada, just in, <laughs> in the middle of the country. 51st state, of course, we know Canada. Hey, yeah. Hey, hey, <laughs> yeah. yeah, in the heart of the Canadian prairies where it's so flat, you can watch your dog run away for days, right? <laughs> uh, our, winters, our winters are cold, our summers are beautiful and short. Um, but I started my MVP journey in 2003 is when I first got awarded. Oh, wow. um, I was nominated by MVP for Outlook Sue Mosher at the time. If you remember her, she used to run outlookcode.com yeah. after running um, uh, slipstick.com for many years, which is now owned by Diane Peremsky. So um, I was doing a lot of work answering questions in the Outlook VBA um, news groups and Usenet. Microsoft.program.outlook underscore VBA, I think it was, which was the catch all for anything Outlook programming related, whether it was add ins or whatnot. So I had uh, was doing some work. I was working with a Microsoft partner at the time, and we were doing some integration with their, um, with a lot of the document management and imaging and knowledge management software that we were selling to clients mm -hmm. and all needed to integrate with Office and Outlook. So I started learning Outlook scripting, Outlook add ins, you know, by trial by fire going to the forums, going to the websites. And after a few months of that, I was, hey, I can answer this question. I can answer that question. Just kept yeah. doing that. And yeah. eventually she said, hey, you're doing a great job here. I'm gonna nominate you for the program. And then I got that famous award, MVP, MVP, like that old, that video that they showed us at the summit in 2000 something. It's an awful video, but it's awesome. And how awful awesome it was. Yeah, yeah. it was based <laughs> on a music grain, uh, commercial or something like that they took a spin on that but and do you know the buildings i think it was i'm trying to remember i think they filmed that down where like the xbox is like in the redmond offices it was like not on the main campus oh I think okay. it was it yeah familiar. but yeah. yeah but yeah well a lot of the microsoft the old microsoft offices all kind of looked the same way but but yeah it's it but what's also interesting too is that i don't know uh, it, like I get the question of, well, you know, what can I do? People that are interested in becoming an MVP nowadays. And one of the first things I say is like, go participate in the forums, like go to, to tech community. I think there Microsoft really still watches that thing. But back in the, the old days, we you, you look at like the longtime MVPs and former MVPs, the, that forum participation was a big part of the activity. Now it just seems to focus more on, uh, uh, on events and that kind of public speaking. Yeah, it certainly seems to have shifted. And um, I did my part, you know, doing all the uh, check boxes for all the various areas, like speaking at conferences. I co-wrote Office Professional 2013 step-by-step -step for Microsoft Press. Uh, I've done the user group start, uh, starting up. I, I founded a, user, a SharePoint user group locally, you know, done the blogs, the book editing, all that stuff you kind of, you get the opportunity to do even more when you're part of the program. So, uh, but that getting that award for the first time in 2003 really changed my life. Like having that feather in your cap and being globally recognized as, as an expert and being knighted by Microsoft, really all of a sudden the, the, the request for work and assistance started coming in all over the world um, from all over the world. And I th started thinking maybe I should take a stab at going independent because I was, had been working as a, as a consultant for several Microsoft providers or partners. So I, I did take a stab at that and I went independent in 2008. I've been independent ever since. Hmm. And I think I thank a lot of that to the uh, to that award for exposing me, giving me opportunities. And I never missed a summit in 15 years. Still haven't missed one since I was out in 2018 because they haven't had an in-person one. But yeah. I got to meet so many smart, wonderful people. Uh, the highlight of my summit was always just walking around 
um, the uh, international uh, supper and just finding old friends and just being part of a group and having just the best conversations and learning so much from people. Uh, and it really shines through in all the MVPs. It, like they're the first to give you advice um, and talk to you in ways where you just are just amazed at how smart and wonderful everybody is. And yeah, just yeah. feel great to be part of that community. So That's why, I, I mean, I, I so hope, so hope that we get back to in-person MVP summits. Yeah, um, I'm not heard any rumors about it one way or the other, but, um, you know, obviously being virtual during the, during the pandemic, but I would tell, you know, new MVPs that I talk to that it's the, it's the best part, the best benefit of getting the award is that participation. Now it's great to go out to Microsoft campus for those that have never been out there. I lived out in Seattle for 12 years and worked for Microsoft for several years. And it is, but still it's great to be on campus. I always think it's better to be on campus and not be an employee. Uh, Cause I, I don't care about the rest of what's going on. I just get to be there and concentrate on the good stuff. But just uh, to, to do those deep dives with the product teams, yeah. I've got to dinners and mixers, but then just to listen to, like, I've got my questions and it's great, but just to listen in that venue to the, these smart people around you, most of them pretty smart. Oh, I won't say all, you know who you are out there, um, <laughs> but, uh, but to listen to their questions and kind of and feed off each other. Uh, you know, uh, so I'm, I'm very much a collaboration person personality like that i get energy from other people like that so i just i get excited by that whereas my wife is the classic introvert where talking to people it, it just physically drains her where she needs to recharge in a uh, a sensory uh, uh you know a uh, uh, chamber a yeah. you know she needs, just needs to be uh, uh removed from from the world but it, it, you have that experience at those events just to, you know, hear other people's ideas. I, I come out of that thing. A lot of my notes are blog ideas or interview ideas, or we should be looking in this other direction. And so you spend a, a week or two getting back from that, just trying to compile the, the notes and figure out what other meetings do I need to go schedule yeah. people to connect with. I love that aspect of it. Absolutely. All, I always enjoyed uh, meeting with the product managers. Um, and those are always eye-opening to see how things work behind the scenes, how they plan features, how long it takes for some of the simplest features to get developed. Mm -hmm. uh, but being able to contribute too, like and say, no, you should be looking at this feature or why you're looking at this feature. Because a lot of the times our interactions with the community um, give them insights that they don't typically have. Um, they have their own test groups and other programs for early adopters as well, but we, we tend to be in the trenches and, and we have viewpoints that they never usually consider. And, and they're really, um, sometimes you get the product groups that are kind of dismissive of MVPs, but over time they have learned to recognize how much of a benefit we can be. We'd be the first to hold their feet to the fire when something is going really horribly wrong, but we would be the first to praise them when they've done a great job. Yeah. I, I think that's uh, you see that too, from, uh, who's participating within the MVP discussions, like who from the product team, from the engineering teams are kind of known quantities, their faces and names are familiar because they're out there, you know, interacting, not just with MVPs, with the customers as well. And then there's a reason why you, you when you're, you hear about promotions and the growth of you know, people within that, and usually it's a one-to-one -one match, the people that are very community centric and, and in touch with the MVPs seem to be the people that, also uh, rise very quickly within the organization because they kind of they get that so i think it's just another testament to the power of community and the importance of community uh to both sides multiple voices multiple ideas surround yourself with smart people and listen to them kind of thing yep well not one person has all the answers and especially in software <laughs> Well, you talked about it, you kind of it, you shared some of your experiences becoming an mvp anything about it i mean where was it something that did you hear about it and seek after it or is it something that more just kind of evolved and happened over time or i don't think i knew much about it i think uh, when i was posting in the forums i recognized that oh there's some other people here that are kind of official and they had this mvp designation and i think i looked into it briefly but it wasn't a goal um and i learned after becoming after uh, getting into the program that's kind of uh, a full pot to actively look like you're trying to become an mvp it was in some situations, it was like, nah, you got you got to earn it, buddy. 
and um, it was kind of frowned upon. It's not something you should just be doing it naturally, I guess, is the message that if you're not helping people to begin with, then it's don't use it as a career stepper um, because you just might disappear once you get it and you're not contributing anymore. So it's always. So how, how do you look like you're trying without looking like you're trying? <laughs> I guess it's dedication and frequency and the attitude that you have when you're answering questions. Like uh, if you're yeah. riddling people, that's obviously not a good approach to helping. You know, like, yeah, why'd you do that? And that's not going to help anybody. You just be carefully walking through um, and, and show them additional resources to get them going. Um, it's always, uh, they, you know, how many times have uh, us as MVP just been really uh, thanked heartily by somebody and it makes us feel good of course which is great but you know you have to want to help people and and uh get them unstuck as part of yeah. your goal well it's i yeah i remember having a conversation with a former employer that was commenting that i had uh, participated in an event and flown halfway around the world and it was like my time and and i i got the the event paid for part of the expense of that and i did some out of pocket just before I joined, he's just like, well, what a complete waste of time. You got there across the world and you participated as one speaker and you presented to like under 20 people and went and did that. And I'm like, okay, you clearly don't understand the, the value of like, okay, who was in the room? And I wasn't selling anything. There was no pitch. I wasn't, I'm not a consultant. I was, I'm a, been a product guy. So like I had no uh, a sale in the game by going and doing that it was purely about community and uh that uh went, was down in south africa by the way it's like so i have off of that trip it was my first time down there was one of the i still have friends that i talk to on a regular basis people that i've been able to some that have become mvps since yeah. then and the connections that have been made and the perspective shared i mean i don't know it, there could be four or five people in the audience. Uh, I've done sessions like that. I did one. Uh, we I helped put on an event in Bend, Oregon. The biggest event, we did it for several years. The largest we ever got was 98 people. It was the, the largest year that we were there. And it was one of the best events. And it, just a, a few small companies, no massive brand names that were in the area, you know, and but it was, you know, the connections we made, the value that we provided there, the conversations that we had, and it, it was fulfilling because we're helping people solving, you know, larger strategic questions and small tactical, practical problems uh, with the technology, just sitting there talking technology with people that are passionate about technology. It energized me for weeks afterwards with everything else that I did back in the office. The impact is per person, right? Yeah. It's you impact one person significantly it's it's worth it than more worth it than in given 20 people sort of an idea or however you want to phrase it but yeah well i'll have to ask you to the few minutes we have left is uh is about the music side of things because you do have the devices behind you and uh so you know what what's your uh what's your musical background um well i Spent five years as a guitarist in an Iron Maiden tribute band here in Manitoba called Maiden Manitoba, as most Iron Maiden tribute bands tend to add their geographical location to the name. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was playing the part of Dave Murray, the longtime uh, Iron Maiden guitarist who stands on the right side of the stage looking towards the crowd. And that was uh, that was a dream fulfilled because I was in a band in my 20s with some friends and we didn't take it too seriously. We just played some parties and at the bar where we work and um, we were just happier just watching live music all the time. So when I got this opportunity to join this band, it fulfilled a lifelong dream of being uh, uh, a part time musician for a long time. So uh, for five years, we did 50 shows around the province and we were gearing up to do U.S. tours when um um, issues with the band arose which always seems to happen right which happens yep now it's a, in a different flavor with um all new members except for a drummer who replaced our previous drummer you know it's always the thing with bands but it was great it, uh i love performing um and uh it was an eye-opener how to uh it's a, it's a different skill set when you're performing in front of a an audience of people that you're giving a technical presentation to versus entertaining them with music you have to look them in the eye you have to you're, you're you're presenting at the same time 
Uh, but you can't just stand there staring at your guitar or your shoes. You got to look people in the eye and show them a good time. Yeah. And the funny thing is I learned that really for the first time back in 2008 at the MVP summit, when we had the party at the experience music project and they had that it was a kind of a rock and roll theme or a musical theme night where they encouraged people to dress as, as musicians. And they, and they had the, the live band karaoke, the rock karaoke thing there. Mm -hmm. And I went up and I did enter Sandman. And I was so nervous before that. And I had dressed in, I had a long black curly wig and Aussie glasses and a jean jacket. I looked like a total banger, right? Because I am a banger. Um, <laughs> but I was so nervous. I'm like, you know what? This isn't about me. I got, nobody wants to see somebody up on stage looking nervous, right? And I only had a handful of experiences performing live. And, and that was 15 years prior. So I just shoved aside all that nervous energy and said, I'm going to entertain that crowd. And it was the best stage possible. I don't know if you were at that particular summit, but the Experience Music Project has this one huge area where you can have a live show and the backdrop is insane. Yeah. And yeah. most of the crowd was there, um, 400, 500 people maybe in front of the stage. And they ate everything up. Uh, MVPs, you know, and they were singing along and it was, it was amazing. And I got a video of that on YouTube um, that's still out there somewhere. And... Um, that gave me the impetus to say, well, I got to try this performing thing again. And it took a few years before I had the opportunity, but uh, I certainly uh, want to uh, get back to doing that. I was doing live streams during the pandemic where I was like, I need to perform. So I'm just going to learn yeah. the tech, how to do all this myself with multiple scenes per song, all controlled by a tablet with OBS studio. And yeah, so I really over-engineered that. Like I do everything. Hmm. Um, but I had an hour and a half of material. And so I'm hoping to get back into a band at some point, but, uh, yeah. Uh, Cause I, I, uh, similar to that, I was the lead singer of an alt rock band. I was, you know, we did that for three years and we toured around Northern California. And I, I always tell people that, uh, like, I don't get really get nervous on stage. You get a little bit butterflies when there's like, especially new content until you're up there and then it's just fine and go. And I really enjoy it. And a lot of that was kind of, as I always tell people burned out of me because of being up there with all original content. So they're my words. It's my voice out in front of the band, you know, doing this stuff, playing shows. And you, you, it, it just, I got used to that. I always say the same thing. I, I miss doing that performing. I, I enjoyed that. Oh, it's, um, a it's uh yeah, I, I, I love doing that. I, I, now we never, uh, as a studio band, like we, we never had the money. We were poor back then. Uh, we never had the money to do quality recordings. So the stuff we have is just crap. And we've got stuff straight out of the, the, the soundboard at a couple stages that we performed uh, kind of things, but man, it's still, it wouldn't replace that for anything. And, you know, anybody that has any music passion uh, you know, that to, to go and have that experience. Yeah. I, I, similar. I, I would love to go and do something like that. I'd rather do kind of a home studio project, find people to have that, the, the pieces and participate that way. Um, I, I'm okay with, I always said that uh, this is just like the old me talking now. Like I loved doing the shows. I didn't like a lot of the venues and the people that I had to deal with to get the gigs. <laughs> that's, that's a slog. But, yeah. Yeah. But that was an, an adventure, but yeah, I, you know, I, I love the, uh, uh, there's a you know a lot of people that have that music background have a kind of a similar story to uh, to to get again and comfort with public speaking uh, within the MVP circles. Yeah, so yeah. We, need, we need more MVP based bands is what I'm saying. They've tried. <laughs> they've had. They've tried, but it's tough when you get five people who've never jammed before. What are we going to play? And some you know, let's play Blackbird. I don't know Blackbird. Yeah. yeah. But I've been having fun. Um, like you mentioned, the home studio bit. I've got a uh, pretty good setup down here. I'll, I'll show you uh, what I've got going on. Uh, so that's kind of like my photo slash video slash audio studio. Yep. There's some cars back there that you can't see in a drum set. And um, uh, yeah, I'm really set up to do some pretty decent audio and video production. So I'm learning and ramping up those skills. So I would like love to produce other talent um, because it's a pain in the, in the butt to produce your own stuff with no help but yeah. the technology is there to do it um but it takes a lot of time video yeah. editing is not easy audio editing is not easy but we're mvps we know how to master complex software but it takes a lot of time to get close to those levels of uh, talent that people who do this all the time have 
Yeah, I had a good friend that did his uh, master's in music composition. And he I remember going over to his apartment and doing we did a studio project for a while. And he was using at the time Cakewalk. So this was late 90s. And he had it tuned up. And so I, I went and did some edits. I'm like, hey, this is so hard. Then I went and installed Cakewalk. I'm like, okay, I understood then very quickly he had spent a lot of time meticulously going through and organizing and getting it ready where I could simply go and mix things with the music that we had, we had captured. So it's everything about, uh, you know, just like in video production, you know, the, 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 the getting the, the sounds, right. The music there for, for doing video production, the lighting has to be right. And the audio so much. and all those pieces, and then edit all those pieces together and do all the transitions and, yeah, there's there's a lot, a lot. Kudos to everybody with a with a YouTube channel that's you know got some polished production. Um, you you have to do it, or you would stand out like a sore thumb. It's, you know, you can't just record something on your phone. You got to stand out, and everybody's doing the high quality productions, so it's it's difficult. It takes time to get to that level. That's for sure. It does. Well, very cool. Well. Eric, really appreciate you taking time today. For folks that want to find out more about you or connect with you, what are the best ways to reach you? Um, I guess the best way is to start with uh, Twitter, as long as it's still up and I'm still on there. Still going today. Day, um, <laughs> just look for my name, Eric.lego on whatever platform um, or ericlegoconsulting.com is my website. Um, yeah, drop me a line, send me an email at eric at ericlego.com and I'll go to you, my YouTube channel and see I got a lot of uh, my music content up there i've even got some cooking shows those during the pandemic and uh, soon i hope i'm uh, in pre pre-production for a series on critical thinking nice. that's taken a lot of pre-production effort to the point where i'm like i don't know if i'll ever have time to actually finish this so i keep telling people about it so i'm hold accountable if i never do it like you said you're going to do it but it's going to take a lot of time but i want to contribute to this climate where there's just so much division and then there's ways we need to get people talking and not arguing and that's what i'm yep. hoping to gear up towards doing it's a great topic and again i think uh, to your point like props to those people that are the content creators of training material of learning material that come like i know what it takes like i don't have the time to go build that kind of content like it's yeah. it, it, there's people have a passion and have that expertise in that field but well, Eric, really appreciate the time. Of course, I have the links, everything out on my blog, out on Buck the Planet when, the, when this goes live. You'll see it out on YouTube, so I'll provide all those links to everybody. So whether you're listening or watching, you'll be able to find that. Go to buck And Eric, thanks a lot for your time. Thank you for having me, Christian. Cheers.